Welcome to the Culture Lab. I'm your host, Aga Bayer. This podcast helps you turn your company culture into rocket fuel for meaningful growth. It gives you the tools and inspiration to make work synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging. This is where we explore how to cultivate remarkable cultures, cultures that scale and evolve as our businesses grow and the world keeps on changing. When you think about what I teach in this new book, how to work with almost anyone, and this idea of a keystone conversation, which is a conversation about how we be together, there are five questions which we're going to touch on. And you think that the immediate benefit you get are the answers to the five questions, and no doubt that is true. But there's a longer, deeper, bigger win, which is permission to acknowledge and talk about and come back to the health of the working relationship. It actually says this is a thing <laughs> rather than I'll just cross my fingers and hope that that thing somehow is okay. Hey friends, welcome to episode 116 of the Culture Lab podcast. This episode is brought to you by Culture Brain, a one-of-a-kind accelerator program where culture leaders get hands-on support and guidance on how to reach their goals faster, especially now in this brave new world of remote and hybrid work. Culture Brain connects you with outstanding peers on the same journey, but also with world-class experts, including people you know from the show. And they all help you identify and implement new, better ways of creating a culture where people do their best work. Check it out at tinyurl.com forward slash culturebrained. And no need to write it down. There's a link in the show notes. The average human spends 90,000 hours of their life at work. And they form hundreds, if not thousands, of working relationships during their entire careers. And researchers have found that doing well in our careers depends as much on our relationships as it does on our jobs themselves. But the quality of our working relationships doesn't only impact our careers. On a collective level, it impacts company culture. And perhaps most importantly, it impacts our entire lives. I mean, I'm sure that you've had colleagues who made your life richer and better. And I'm also sure that you've had those who were a gigantic pain in the butt. And given the impact working relationships have on us, you think that we would be a little bit more proactive or intentional about nurturing them. Instead, we often let them evolve by chance. And this is one of the reasons why we have decided to devote the whole month of July in the Culture Brain community to how to improve working relationships one conversation at a time. My guest today, Michael Bangistania, has a lot to say on this topic. In fact, he wrote an entire book about taking an intentional approach to improving relationships at work. Michael is at the forefront of shaping how organizations around the world make being coach-like an essential leadership competency. His book, the Coaching Habit, it's unweird coaching and is the best-selling coaching book of the century with over a million copies sold and more than 10,000 five-star reviews on Amazon. In 2019, he was named the number one thought leader in coaching. And this is the second time that I have him on the show. And this time round, we're going to talk about how you can work with almost anyone. With no further ado, here is Michael Bungie Stanier. I'm Michael Bungie Stanier, sometimes called MBS, although not the MBS who's running Saudi Arabia. If you know me at all, you know me for a book called The Coaching Habit, which has become the best selling book on coaching this century. But I'm a writer, I write books, design courses, and my overall goal is to unlock greatness, yours and the people that you're working with. Michael, welcome back to the Culture Lab. It is nice to be back. Thank you for having me. I am so excited about this conversation. I know that you have a new book coming out and it's on how to be more intentional about our work relationships. That's right. And it holds a big and appealing promise to show us 
how to work with anyone or almost anyone. Almost anyone, exactly. Almost that, anyone. That, that yeah. almost is really important. I almost called the book How to Work with Anyone. And I'm like, ah, I think I'm over promising there. <laughs> I don't think I can, I know how to do that. But I think I could give people some good clues as to how to work with almost anyone. Yeah, I definitely want us to do a deep dive into that because I cannot imagine anyone who wouldn't want that, right? But before we go there, I have this question that I ask all of my guests at the beginning of each interview. And the question is about the early cultural influences that shaped you as a person. What were they? Well, I'm a returning guest. So <laughs> we'll see if my <laughs> answer is the same as they were in the first conversation that we had. I would say the towering influence is my dad, who had a, a great kind of moral stand in how he saw the world. And he, he died two or three years ago. And so I've been thinking about him a fair bit recently. And in part, he was a great man of service. He really was forever signing up for volunteer groups and building groups and committees and boards and basically all sorts of stuff that involved relentless amounts of meetings, which would do my head in. <laughs> it's like, the, that's the worst thing ever for me, which is endless meetings. But my dad loved it. But I would say that I do consider the work I do and frame it as an act of service. I'm trying to give to the world more than I take. I'm trying to give people the confidence and the competence to make brave choices and to show up as the best version of themselves and to unlock their greatness. There's all sorts of peripheral things around you. Everything about where you grow up influences you. So from the landscape to my brothers, to my parents, to the schools I went to. But in terms of a character, a person who has the most influence on, on who I am today, it's probably dad. First of all, I'm sorry to hear about your dad's passing. Thanks. And thank you for sharing that. And I think you do live that life of service. This is at least how I perceive you and your work. And I'm always struck by how much empathy you have for the people that you serve and the beautiful approach that you take to really act on that empathy, which is simplifying really complex concepts. And that's a hard thing to do. And it's definitely one of the reasons why I love your work and I love oh, what you're you. doing. I appreciate you naming that. There's a great saying around striving for simplicity on the other side of complexity. And I do think about that when I work, like when I write a book, for instance, I'm always thinking to myself, what's the shortest book I can write that's the most useful book? And I'm always trying to find metaphor and language to try and unweird the stuff that people kind of get. I mean, when you talk about how to work with almost anyone, people have known forever that they're like, I should try and think about how to build better working relationships. I should try and go for psychological safety. But there's not a whole lot of clues as to how exactly to do that. Yes. And that's what I'm trying to, to work on. Yes. And I can tell that I think it really translates into your books, that intention to simplify and be super useful. So listen, before we dive into <laughs> the how to work with almost anyone, and the main thesis of the book, plus hopefully also the five questions that yeah. can help us build better work relationships. I want to set the stage a little bit. First of all, being a writer myself, I know that when you decide to write a book, it <laughs> tends to be quite personal. It's a very hard undertaking. And I think in most cases, authors are kind of scratching their own niche with their books or maybe teaching a lesson that they feel like they need to master themselves. And I was curious, has this been the case for you with this book? Well, it's a combination of things. I got introduced to this idea broadly, I'm going to say 25 years ago, perhaps, maybe, yeah, it's probably about right. I'm working with a teacher called Peter Block. And Peter Block talked about social contracting as a way of figuring out how to work better together. You know, in terms of my work mentors, Peter Block is one of the top two or three people whose work has deeply influenced mine. Yes, yeah, amazing. And so for many years, I've been trying to have conversations with people about how we work together beyond the conversation about what we're working on, which is if you had to put that singular idea at the heart of the book, that's it. Have, have a conversation about how you work together, not just conversations about what you're working on. So that's been something I've been practicing for quite a long time and trying to get better at and trying to figure out when it works and when it doesn't work and what questions are most useful and which questions are less useful. But there was a, a catalyzing moment actually around my dad's death. So this was three years ago, thereabouts. I was back in Australia 
living in my parents' home, actually living in my childhood bedroom because they'd lived in the same house for 50 some years. Dad had miraculously not died in the intensive care unit, which is what we all thought was going to happen. He kind of recovered and bounced back a little bit and had come home and he was living at home, but in a hospital bed, he had a terminal illness. So we knew it was for a period of weeks or months and we weren't sure. We know who knows how long that's going to be for. And my parents have had a very successful marriage for 55 years. They were a really tight couple. They really loved each other. They supported each other. They were simpatico. They were self-contained, really, as a couple. It was, it was a really powerful role model for me in terms of what it means to be in a marriage. But nobody was having great fun <laughs> with dad being home for all the reasons you'd expect. I mean, not only it's like the sadness of we knew dad that was dying, but also it just disrupted their usual ways of being with each other. Dad couldn't really get out of bed much. So he was like, can you bring me this? Can you bring me that? Mom's like, I don't want to be his handmaiden. You know, he spent a lifetime being a equal doer of the chores around the house. So they were kind of bickering a little bit with each other. They were a bit fractious. And <laughs> an act of supreme foolishness slash courage slash I don't know what. I was like, let's have a conversation. Me facilitating the two of you to talk about how you want to be together over the next period of time. That is very courageous. I was proud of myself for taking <laughs> the plunge on that. Because there's lots of conversations about the what. You know, where does the hospital bed go? How do we deal with the oxygen tanks? How, what's catering? What's this? What's that? I mean, there's a relentless amount of stuff to talk about. I didn't particularly want mum's last memories of you know, the last few months with my dad to be ones of bickering. Because, you know, we know from the recency effect that your last memories of an experience ha have a really strong influence on your overall memories of an experience. And they've got 55 really great years. The last two months could kind of spoil 55 years of memories. So it's like, I'm going to make it as, as good as it can be. It's not going to be great because dad's dying. But what's the best possible way of them being together over the, over the coming period of time? So we had that conversation. Mum and dad were deeply... <laughs> Resistant is too strong a word, but mum was like, I don't want to do that at all. <laughs> Dad was like, it sounds, I don't know, why don't we give it a go? And finally they, they did it and it went well and they were great. And I think it helped a bit. How did you position this conversation? I'm not that good at being tricky. So I was kind of blunt about it. I was like, I kind of said to them what I just said to you. What if we had a conversation just so you guys figure out how to best be with each other in a really stressful situation? Because you're under pressure. You're a bit sneaky with each other at times. We know it doesn't mean that much, but it means something. So what about it? Mom's like, nope. <laughs> Dad's like, probably not. <laughs> and I just kept coming back to it, going, what about it? And eventually they, uh, I kind of bullied them into it, I guess. They gave in. Yeah. So how did it go in the sense of what was the outcome? I'm pausing on my answer just because when you think about what I teach in this new book, How to Work with Almost Anyone, and this idea of a keystone conversation, which is a conversation about how we be together. There are five questions which we're going to touch on. And you think that the immediate benefit you get are the answers to the five questions, and no doubt that is true. But there's a longer, deeper, bigger win, which is permission to acknowledge and talk about and come back to the health of the working relationship. It actually says this is a thing <laughs> rather than I'll just cross my fingers and hope that that thing somehow is okay. So there was still some bickering, but it lost a little bit of its edge, I think. There's also a, you know, an opportunity for them in various ways to talk about how much they appreciated each other, how much they loved each other, what this meant to them. It kind of had a deeper level to the conversation as well. So I'm going to say it was a success. I mean, I think very rarely does a conversation about how you work together become a failure, even if it's a weird, difficult, awkward conversation where the answers are, that don't always make sense. The meta level win is we're talking about the health of the working relationship rather than just fighting or fleeing, which is often what happens in working relationships. Yeah. And I want to come back to this point that you've made around actually acknowledging that the relationship is a thing, right? It's not just about you and about me, but we have this thing that is common to us and actually we both care about it. And I think it's such a great starting point, really, because for many of us, at least the way I see it, we don't always consciously acknowledge that we have a relationship. 
even at work with our coworkers, right? We think about the content of work, what needs to be done, as you say, or individuals even. But the thing that is called relationship. Yeah, the us. <laughs> right, the us. We don't yeah. really spend too much time thinking about it. And of course, the bigger us, and this is not the us spelled A-S-S, by the way, listeners. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about so the us spelled yeah. U-S. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The biggest us is really company <laughs> now I culture, can't not right? Hear ASS. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, it's, about, it's funny, you know. It's hard to go back once you hear it. You cannot unhear it. <laughs> yeah, company culture. We also really actually think about it, this collective us, right? And what it means to us. So I'm really glad that you've mentioned that. And thank you for sharing this. Well, company culture, amongst other things, is how we do stuff around here. Yeah. I mean, there's more to it than that, but that's the kind of the manifestation of a company culture, which is what are the behaviors, the unconscious and the conscious behaviors. Work gets done through people. <laughs> so you behave in response to people. You know, when I think about all the work I've thought about and done on company cultures in the past, it's often about here are your behaviors. <laughs> Here's how you should be behaving. This is what you should be doing. And there's other things around, you know, the artifacts and the espoused values or whatever model you want to use around that. You don't really realize that you're not atomic in your interaction and your behavior in an organization or anywhere. It's all in relation to other people. So exactly. unless you figure out how you want to behave with other people, you're not really working on a company culture. Yeah, totally. And those patterns of behaviors as well, right? Because I think sometimes, you know, you might see a behavior, but it's isolated. It only happens once. And I don't think that it translates into your culture. But when you start seeing patterns of behaviors emerging all over the place. That's definitely culture. And so that's a superficial, visible level of culture that we see, of course, underneath it. You have a lot of stuff like assumptions and beliefs and so on, but absolutely the way we do things around here and the patterns around that are culture. And so unless we talk about, you know, what kind of patterns of behaviors we want to have in the situation, it's really hard to shape it. You're far more expert in this than I am, but I often enough in the past have talked about the company culture being like a pointillist painting. So these little dots of color. And when you're close to them, they're just little dots of color. But when you step back, they come, become a painting and they become an image. And you don't have to get too many of those dots wrong <laughs> for the picture to, to break, for the whole thing not to work. But also when you look at it, it's not just a red dot, it's a red dot next to a green dot. And it's the relationship of those dots of color to the other dots of color that allow the picture to emerge, that allow the corporate culture to emerge. Yeah. Michael, this is such a beautiful metaphor. I've never heard it before. Such an accurate one. Thank you for sharing it. Sure. I love it, love it, love it. <laughs> Let's talk about the book and the messages in the book. So if I understand the main thesis of your book correctly, now it's a test for me, I guess, is that every working relationship can be better if only we become intentional about nurturing it. I think that's exactly right. Cool. And I think that what you're saying is that the desired outcome of that intentional approach is something that you've alluded to already uh, when you talked about the best possible outcome is the best possible relationship in this case or a BPR for short. That's right. And then you say the key action that you can take to move uh, towards a BPR, so the best possible relationship, is something that you've already mentioned, which is the keystone conversation. Mm -hmm. Am I getting this right so far? You are. It's worth pausing just to say, for the people who are going, wait, are you saying that every relationship can be really great at work? I'm like, actually, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that if you think about your present and past working relationships, they probably map out on something like a bell curve. So you'll have a few up one end where you're like, these are magical, they're fantastic. I love working with that person. We just kind of like zoomed, we click. We jive. Yeah, exactly. And you probably got some down the other end where you're like, yeah, that was hard, <laughs> that was miserable, that was difficult, that felt broken, that felt sand in the gears. And sometimes you can say that's because that the other person was you know, crazy. Mm -hmm. But often enough, even if it's like the other person was okay, we just couldn't figure it out. And then most of them are somewhere in the middle. And this book has a thesis that you can make the bad ones bearable. You can make the bad ones good enough and workable, which is a huge win. Huge. 
in some ways that could be the biggest outcome, which is like, it's not just keeping the really brilliant ones a little more brilliant and brilliant for longer and adding some more magic to the ones in the middle. That's great as well. But gosh, think of your five worst working relationships, ones that are really hard. And if they became 10 to 20% easier, oh boy, what would that bring you in terms of success and happiness? I think quite a significant boost. And mental health, right? Yeah, because especially exactly. these difficult relationships, they can really turn our lives into... Exactly, they can eat you up. Yeah, totally. Okay, first things first. What are the universal characteristics of these best possible relationships? You talk about them being safe, vital, and repairable. Can you elaborate on that? Of course. So safe is a good place to start, and it's the one that's most familiar because most of us have heard of psychological safety and Amy Edmondson. You know, she's been championing that work for quite a while now. I think it's got a bit loose as to what we even mean by psychological safety. We're like, what what are we even talking about there? But Amy Edmondson would say it's about feeling like you can say what needs to be said without repercussions. There's also a way, it's also about showing up as who you are without repercussions. And so just you know, when you look at Amy Edmondson's work or the work you know, from people like Google with Project Oxygen and Project Aristotle about the highest performing teams and the highest performing managers, you can just see that psychological safety becomes this drumbeat that just needs to be there. And we've just got much better at understanding how important that is and, and the cost of not having psychological safety. I actually don't want a working relationship that is only psychologically safe because as much as that kind of nurtures some part of me, it can also blanket some other parts of me. So that's why the second attribute is vitality. And, you know, vital has two meanings. One is essential, but one is full of life. And just recently I heard this uh, talked about as psychological bravery, which I love. Oh my goodness, what a great phrase that is. If it's not just psychological safety, it's psychological bravery. And how do those two pair up together? Because in any working relationship, you need to find the right mix of safety and bravery between the two of you so that you can both be fully expressed. You can be at your full potential. You can be doing the work that matters. You can both keep each other safe and push each other and challenge each other and provoke and nudge and kind of move people like that. So that's safety and vitality. So that's the first two. And they're, they're in a dance with each other. There's a different equation, of a different algorithm of safety and vitality between me and person A and me and person B and person B and person A. Depends. Sure. The third attribute is repairable. Now, in doing the work around this new book, I didn't do much primary research. That's not really my style, but I did a lot of secondary research. So writing people who are writing about stuff. And I would read people like Esther Perel and Terry Reel and Dan Siegel and John Gottman, um, some of the really significant influences and in relationships, you know, kind of married or kind of personal relationships. And it became really clear that relationships that last, people know how to repair them. <laughs> and it also became really clear that we're not very good at repairing them. <laughs> like, yeah. There seemed to be a common theme. It's like, we, we so quickly and easily back away from the hard stuff, that the repairability, we tend to take it personally, throw up our hands, or we tend to just ignore it. And it is true that often things are to an extent self-healing. Like if you've had a, a fractious moment at work, you know, two weeks later, you're kind of back to where it was, but kind of, and not quite back to where it was. Yeah. And the ability to more actively go, how do we fix it when things go wrong? and be the person who goes, let's fix it because things have gone wrong, gives you a chance to actually build an even deeper, more trusting working relationship. Yeah, that makes total sense. And I think that, you know, sometimes we think of repairs to relationships as this huge thing. But I think what you're saying and the way you talk about it is these tiny little things, like the moment you see a tiny leak somewhere, you act on it immediately, right? It's almost like great. an apartment. When you think about your apartment, you wouldn't <laughs> leave a huge leak running in your apartment because you need to live in it. And the same thing, I think, is true for our work relationships. Right. We need to live in them. And so repairing them needs to be this ongoing process when whenever something happens, you're saying we shouldn't be sweeping it under the carpet. We should take action 
to make things better immediately? I'm going to say a strong maybe to that. And here's why it's a strong maybe. I think it depends on you and that other person. Like what I've learned is best for me is exactly that, which is like, don't step over the small things. <laughs> Check in regularly and go, hey, how are you doing? How am I doing? How are we doing? You know, a question that I talk about in the book and that I think is lovely is what needs to be said that hasn't been said? Particularly powerful if like me, I mostly hold the upper hand in terms of power and status and the working relationships I have because I'm older, <laughs> I'm a tall, straight, white man. I founded a couple of companies and so I'm the kind of the founder of the two companies within which I work. So it's harder for people to bring stuff up for me. So I'm constantly trying to open the door to say, is there anything that needs to be said that we haven't touched on here? Anything that feels inarticulate or fragile or delicate that you want to bring forth? But some people might go, look, my way of repairing is give me 48 hours and I'm over it. <laughs> yeah. And you may go, that's my way of repairing it too. <laughs> so if that's the case, if you both go, look, we prefer it if we just, we're really good at getting back to where we were. So let's carry on like that. Then you're like, we don't need to check in all the time. But the point is you figure it out and you talk about it. You figure it out. Yeah. Because what you're doing is you're giving each other to keep checking in on the health of the working relationship. Yeah. I understand that this is exactly why you say one of the ways to build this relationship is through a conversation. And exactly. we'll get there. But before that, I want to take our listeners on a little journey with us. So let's say that they want to identify their BPR person to focus on for now, just to bring this to life a little bit more for people. What should we keep in mind to zoom in on the relationship that we should really be investing in? Because you know, you have a lot of relationships at work, let's be honest, for most people, pretty large teams. So like, how do we know that certain relationships are perhaps more important or we should be focusing on these relationships now? Well, I think you can just use a, a fairly simple litmus test to go, who influences my success and who influences my happiness? <laughs> and those people, you should think about what it would take to build a better working relationship with them. Mm -hmm. So if you're picking somebody to work with now, you could be thinking about, it might be your boss. That's where a lot of people go. If you lead a team, it might be probably everybody on your team you might think about, but maybe there's one or two people where you're like, that, this person in particular. It could be a, a somebody you need to collaborate with in your organization. It could be a vendor who is very significant and has a real influence. It could be a key customer where you're like, we want this to be more than a transactional relationship. We want this to be deeper than that. There are all sorts of people in your ecosystem where you're like, me having a better working relationship with you would make a difference around that. Now, it could also be right at the start of a working relationship. You might be going, I'm just onboarding this person now. This is perfect. I've just hired them. It could also be like right in the middle of it. Like my mom and dad, they're like, we're, they were right in the middle of, uh, well, they, they were they're right at the end of a 55-year-old relationship. I did this a few years ago with Shannon, who is the CEO of Box of Crayons, the training company that I founded. And we basically spent two years managing the transition of her becoming the CEO and me stopping becoming the CEO. We hired a coach. Wow. It was our transition coach, and she spent a year leading up to it and a year after the, the title changed. We'd had a working relationship before, but it was a reset on the working relationship. So we're in the middle of the working relationship with Shannon. It, it'd be like, pick somebody. <laughs> you probably know. You can probably, if I went, who are the three people who have most influence on your success and happiness at, at work? You could probably come up with some names and then pick one. And it might be somebody where you're like, this person I feel pretty safe with. So I could give this a go and if it doesn't quite work or I don't quite get it right the first time, it won't make that much difference. You could pick somebody where it's like a disaster. You're like, this can't actually get any worse. <laughs> so I've got, <laughs> I've got nothing left to lose on this because yeah. if it gets better, I win. And if it doesn't get better, then we're just exactly where we are anyway. Yeah, I, I like that. I like the sense of freedom it, it gives us to think about those things in those terms. Because indeed, I think working with a relationship that seems to be relatively easy creates, I think, this nice sandbox to experiment in. But equally, as you said, the opposite, I think it's a safe sandbox actually to experiment in as well. Okay, so 
as you mentioned, we build these relationships through a conversation. And I have a question that might sound dumb, so I apologize, but I need to ask it to make it super clear for me and for our listeners as well. So this conversation, are we supposed to have it with our BPR person, so the person that we want to improve our relationship with, ourselves, or both? Well, kind of all of the above. It's really designed to be a conversation between you and that other person. It's like, hey, how will we work together? And then there are five questions that you can either follow one after another, like a script, or you can just kind of use a combination, or you can kind of make up your own questions if you want. The win is to talk about how should we work best together? What do I need to know? What do you need to know? It also helps if you know what you're talking about. You know what your preferences are. So kind of in a sneaky way, I've made this book a bit of a self-development book as well as a a tool to make organizations better places to work. Because with each of the five questions, there are three exercises to deepen and expand and make more concrete and make more nuanced and subtle your responses to the five questions. And you could choose to get the book, go through the exercises, and then just as the ancients say, know thyself. You, know, you could just know yourself better. You're like, I have a better idea of how I work in this world. This book will help with that. But what I really hope is that you'll then take that knowledge and go, I'm going to tell some people about what I know about myself in terms of when I work at my best and when I don't work at my best. So they've got the best chance of getting me at my best and they've got the best chance of avoiding me at my worst. Yeah, that makes total sense. And this is actually the first question, right? You call it the amplify question. And it's basically, what's your best? And you've already spoken to why it's important to be asking this question a little bit. There is a nuance that you mention in the book, actually, around this question that I found particularly interesting, because you say, you know, it's not enough to discuss what your best looks like, but also, is it fulfilling to you? Because you might be great at doing something but it might not be your sweet spot in terms of where meaning comes from or just a sense of joy that comes from work. So how do we talk about these things and why is it important to talk about these things? So when I was trying to figure out what question to ask here, I knew I wanted it to be something about amplifying what was good. You know, it's a classic nod to positive psychology or appreciative inquiry or positive deviance, you know, all of those tools that we can think about change to work on, which is like, Turn up the volume on what's working rather than stressing about what isn't working. I didn't want to say, what are you good at? Because that's not always the most interesting thing to talk about and can be a bit historical and a bit limiting in some ways. I didn't want to say, what are your strengths? Because most of us have done some version of the strength finder. We've got our five strengths, but I'm like, I can never quite remember mine. And it's all a bit abstract anyway. Same with what are your values? So what's your best is, when do you shine and when do you flow? People might know Mikhail Csikszentmi Haichi, the Hungarian psychologist who was all about finding the flow state where you're a space where you've got work you care about and you've got some skill with, but it still stretches you and where you know time speeds up and slows down what Cal Newport would call deep work. That's that kind of flow. And shine is when you're looking at somebody and they're like, they're lit up. <laughs> they're in this, you can see it. And it's like, tell me about that. And that might be the task, the actual stuff that you're working on. It might be the type of working relationships you have, you know, what's, what's around you with people. It might be just sort of essential qualities about who you are. But to your point, what's your best is different from what are you good at. And what are you good at can be a bit of a trap because we sometimes get captured by our own competence. <laughs> and... You know it to be true for yourself as you're listening to me speak that there are some things that you're, you're good at or, or certainly very proficient at where you're like, I just never need to do this ever again in my life. I mean, quite frankly, if I never have to do this again in my life, I'd be delighted. But we also fall into the trap of looking at other people and going, if they're good at it, they probably want to do it. If they're good at it, I should probably give it to them to do. So just as a way of negotiating a way of working, imagine if I sat down with you and I said, I'm thinking about me in box of crayons. I am pretty good at facilitating our legacy training courses and I no longer get that fulfilled by it. I certainly can do it and I'll be there as a backup if you need me to do it, but I've lost some of the juice there. My, my juice comes from doing other stuff right now. 
And so teasing apart the difference there can be a really powerful insight on yourself, <laughs> which is like, oh, actually, I don't, I don't get that fulfilled by doing that anymore. And a really powerful thing to communicate to other people. Yeah, exactly. Because I mean, how powerful is that to even have an opportunity to reflect on that? Because I think each of us has those things. And Whitney Johnson talks about the learning curve and how we reach a point where it's time to jump onto the next curve. But often we don't really reflect enough to know that, you know what, I, I'm done here. I've mastered the skill, whatever. And I really feel like it's time for me to explore some new skills or new areas. Yeah, exactly. I love that. So that was the first question. Just to bring it into the context of working conversation. So if we were to have this conversation with our best possible relationship person, would we be asking them, what do you need to be at your best? And then sharing what I need, or it depends on the context. How do you position this question? I think at the moment, the, the starting point is just to tell them what it is. <laughs> like if I go, hey, look, let me tell you about me at my best. I'm often in my room by myself. I'm, I'm designing stuff. I'm actually creating. So I'm not really at a keyboard. I'm with pen and paper and I'm sketching stuff out. Sometimes it's when I'm teaching. So it's when I'm in front of a big crowd of people and I'm facilitating and getting them to interact and being playful and kind of teasing people from the front of it. Sometimes it's when I'm managing it. It's when I'm saying things like, you got this, I can trust you. How can I help? And I'm in a kind of coaching mode around the management of it. And I'm just explaining what it is for me. And so often that, that just opens up a curious conversation. You're like, tell me more about that. What do you mean by that? And what do you need for that? And so it kind of, it can follow into the practicalities of how do you get it or in part, it's, it's like help each other see each other, <laughs> see the person who's in front of you rather than, than what you've made up about who they are. Understand them in a way that has more humanity and more nuance and more subtlety and more joy and more grace, that, <laughs> and bring curiosity to the conversation. You can rattle through the five questions pretty quickly if you wanted to. I'm also seeing some people just like, you know, we're doing one question at a time because each question, it kind of opens up a conversation that can be quite rich and quite interesting. Yes. What would be the best way to do this? I think that it would be nice to give our listeners just a quick overview and then maybe we can do a deeper dive into one of these questions. So the next one is, we kind of already touched upon this in some of your answers because you call it a steady question and it's really all about sharing practices and preferences that people have around work, right? Exactly. So this is, for me, sharing the logistics and the mechanics of how you work. You know, there's a bit of a move in some companies to do something called like a readme document. And the readme document is like you write something up going, here I am. Here's how I like to do meetings. Here's how I like feedback. Here's what I'm good at in terms of email. Here's what I'm bad at with Slack. You know, kind of, a, I'm going to give you my operating manual. But then with a readme document, you're, you're then supposed to just email it to people and they're supposed to somehow read it and somehow suddenly understand you and it comes to life. And I'm like, that is really good information and a terrible process. <laughs> it is a disastrous <laughs> process, certainly compared to what it would mean to sit down and tell people. So this can be everything from, hey, what's your name? Like, my name is Michael Bungay Stanya. It's a bit of a complicated name because when I got married, I took my wife's surname, but we didn't put a hyphen. So Bungay Stanya is actually my surname. Lots of people freak out about Bungay Stanya because I'm like, how do you pronounce it? I mean, my company is literally incorporated as the Banging Spaniel Corporation because <laughs> I once got a letter to Michael Banging Spaniel who got Bungay Stanya completely wrong. I don't like to be called Mike or Mick. I like to be called Michael. Like my two brothers and my extended family call me Mike. That's it. That's the only people who get to call me Mike. So I don't like people just trying to be friendly and shortening my name. I'm a morning person. So I'm often up sending emails at six o'clock because that's the way I work. Sometimes I work on the weekend as well. So I tell people that, that that happens with me. I'm not that good at Slack. Like I got introduced to Slack late in life and I'm like, ah, I don't want to be in the flow of a lot of work. So I'm not that great at kind of being communicated on Slack. So I'm just talking about all of this stuff back and forth, just going, here are the, the mechanics of my working day. It seems common sense to me, but 
nothing's common sense. <laughs> if anything, we're just clearer these days that more and more, less and less is common sense. Yeah, and I think it creates, you know, it puts humans into three dimensions and it really makes them fully come to life in the minds of others when we, you get the insight about the little tiny habits. Because there's something about knowing people's sort of modus operandi and what they like and dislike that is really interesting to us. And that also really enables us to empathize with this person. So I think aside of the practical aspect of sharing all these things, because when you tell me, hey, Aga, you know what? I'm not great with Slack. Of course, it's really important information for me because now I know that probably if I need to communicate something to you urgently, I might have to pick up my phone or maybe WhatsApp right. you or whatever. Exactly. But there's also this piece around now Michael is a living, breathing human being to me more than he used to be because I only saw him through a screen or whatever. That That is at the heart of this whole conversation, which is like, get to know each other as 3D humans and build a working relationship based on that. It's what Martin Buber would call I-thou relationships rather than I-it relationships. So it's kind of getting, not woo-woo exactly, but kind of philosophical. If you work on the assumption that I have, which is organizations have a default to removing humanity rather than adding to humanity because they're a big system and systems are impervious to humanity and they're just trying to preserve the status quo and get the stuff done that the system was set up to get done. Maintaining humanity is an act of rebellion <laughs> in an organization. And that's partly what I want this to be, which is like, what if work could enhance our humanity rather than detract from it? That's exactly my vision and the mission of our company as well. Because, I mean, what's the point? If we cannot do that, then what's the point really of working? And so that's why I love the work that you're doing, because I think these conversations are so incredibly important and in humanizing our workplaces. Yeah. So, okay. So that was the steady question. The next one is good date and then bad date question. So two questions. Mm, let's combine them. Yeah, let's combine those two. So questions three and four. So the key insight behind these two related questions is that our patterns repeat. What happened in the past will happen again in the future. So rather than denying that or being blind to that, why don't you figure out what your patterns are? Why don't you start by figuring out, for instance, when you look back on the best working relationships you've had, ones where you felt challenged and fulfilled and safe and you grew and you had impact, what happened? What can you learn from that? And I think it's interesting to look at what the other person did and didn't do and said and didn't say that helped bring the best of you forth. And it's helpful to understand what you did and didn't do and said and didn't say that brought the best of you forth. Because A, that's really helpful for you to know. <laughs> it's like, oh, this is the type of relationship in which I do well. And as with all these things, it's like, and if you tell the other person, they're probably going to go, I should do more of all of that. <laughs> right, right. You can see how the flip side works, which is if you think back on the frustrating working relationships, what happened? What did you do? What did they do? And just because of our psychological biases, I think if you're thinking about the good date question, what, what will normally happen is when you think of, of the best of your working relationships, we're naturally wired to take more of the credit for that than is perhaps rightfully ours. So give the other person the credit first. What did they do? How did they make this a great working relationship? And likewise, with a bad working relationship, we're more likely to take less of the credit, give them more of the blame for why it wasn't so great. So here, I think the interesting thing to start is, well, what was your contribution to this not working? Because you were culpable and you, you colluded in some ways to make this a less successful working relationship. You know, John Gottman says 70% of what happens in a working relationship is set. It doesn't really change. It's not really changeable. And I think that is a cause of great optimism because it means that 30% of your working relationship <laughs> can be influenced for what's good. That's a third of everything you're doing. Imagine all of your relationships got a third better, 33% <laughs> better. That'd be amazing. Revolutionary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, totally revolutionary. Okay, so I think it's 
pretty clear what these two questions are about and what's the value of exchanging information with someone around that. The final question, the repair question, which is basically how will you fix things when, when something goes wrong? And it's kind of a revolution just saying that because <laughs> it says things are going to go wrong. And when you typically start a working relationship or even in the middle of it, you're like, let's pretend that things won't go wrong. Let's just hope that somehow it's a miraculously blemish-free relationship. And I'm like, they just, that just never happens. There's always a moment where something gets dinged or cracked or bent or twisted or whatever. Sometimes it's a huge explosion. Most often it's not. Most often it's the small things that just kind of rip it, rip at the fabric and kind of break the seams a little bit. And so there's a conversation about, well, how do we repair it? How do we fix it? How do we know when it's going wrong? But really what this is doing is just saying it will go wrong. Let's acknowledge it now so we can keep talking about it when it does or it doesn't go wrong as, as the relationship unfolds. I really love that. And I would like people to have an opportunity to have these conversations with the people that are important to them. And so I'm thinking, okay, so we have the questions and I'm sure that there are some things that we should be doing to carry out these conversations successfully, because probably the content of the conversation is important, but how we go about asking these questions and exchanging the information is equally important. And I can only imagine that there is a lot of stuff that goes into it. Actually, I know because you share some of the stuff in your book. But if you were to give us like maybe top three things to think about to have a great keystone conversation where you discuss some of these questions, what are the top three things? I'm going to give you a top one thing. Okay. <laughs> we can talk about more after that, but I want to just isolate this and go, here's the biggest of all things, is to be the person brave enough to say, let's have a conversation about this. You know, somebody said to me recently, nobody likes to be the first person to say hello everybody likes to be greeted. And if you're the first person to say, hey, could we have a conversation around this? Acknowledging that for most of us, the first time you're doing this, it's going to feel a bit weird. It's going to be, feel a bit awkward. You probably haven't done something like this before, or at least not much. So there's no clear role model <laughs> around what you're doing. For many of us, the first time we're doing this is, is like you're being brave and it will be a bit weird and a bit awkward because you're, you're learning a new skill. You're at that classic consciously incompetent stage, which is brilliant for learning and not so brilliant for actually being it <laughs> and the feelings yeah. that come with it. So I think what's most powerful is for you to say, what if I did this with one person and I tried it out? That's the thing. And that in itself is amazing <laughs> and a great start because you're like, let's have a chat. What you're saying is I care enough about you and this working relationship to actually try and figure out how we do it better. And it's already a contribution and an intervention to the health of the working relationship. Totally. I think it's such a manifestation of care. And this was the thing that struck me, you know, when you shared the story about your parents, that you know, they resisted the idea of having the conversation. But I think the fact that you nudged them to have that conversation because you cared and explained possibly also why you cared or, you know, what, what you think might be important around this conversation, it probably made them open up to it. But it also really is such a powerful statement in itself when we say, as you say, implicitly, we're saying, I care enough about you and about what we're doing here together to want to feel uncomfortable with you and, you know, really <laughs> yeah, exactly. ramble and go through this process, which is not like if we wanted to be in our comfort zone, we would be having beers at the bar. But exactly. I care more than that. And I want to have this conversation with you. And I will say for people who are like, but what does it even look like? At bestpossiblerelationship.com, we've actually filmed a, a Keystone conversation. So me oh, wow. and Ainsley, who I work with, we actually, it's like 25 minutes long. Ainsley has just stepped into a new, more senior role at the company. So we just had a kind of reset, rebalanced conversation going back and forth around that. So you can actually see me role modeling what a bunch of That's that amazing. You know, can look like at bestpossiblerelationship.com. And there's downloads and other stuff you can get there as well. So I think that's the, the number one thing. The second thing is it's helpful to do a little bit of preparation. 
So knowing what these five questions are, you can just think a little bit about your answers to those. If you pick up the book, you can see the exercises to help deepen your answers to that as well. That might be helpful. And it might also be helpful to share those questions with the other person. You know, if I'm talking to Ainsley, I'm like, hey, Ainsley, I, I mean, our working relationship is really important. I think it's going well, but I'd love to have a chat about how we might build the best possible version of this working relationship. Here are the five questions that I'm, I'm thinking about that might be interesting to ask and answer and, and list the five questions. I'm going to be doing some thinking about my answers to those. If you have time, I'd love you to as well. And how about we have a chat next week? And if you're thinking to yourself, but won't the other person be kind of freaking out? <laughs> I'm like, maybe a little bit. But you know, you're, you're responsible for your side of the table, not their side of the table. You've been really explicit about what you want. You've been explicit about your intent. It's not like you're saying to somebody, I've got feedback for you. Please come into my office next week right. and I'll give it to you. That freaks people <laughs> out. <laughs> or even just, please come to my office. <laughs> I need to talk to you. That freaks people out because they're like, what's that about? And of course, everybody goes to the worst thing. But if you say, how do we make what we've got even better? How do we make it the best possible relationship? They're like, okay, as much as they can, they're going to say the intent's good. I'll do the preparation. And what you're doing to come back to our pointillist painting is you're putting a dot of color on the canvas about this is what it means to be with me in this culture. Within every corporate culture, there are subcultures. The potential is that your subculture, the people that you influence, is extraordinary. And in part, it's extraordinary because of the working relationships that you build and that you role model on how to build. And you become that force of, I was going to say change, but you know that saying that the future's here, it's just unevenly distributed. You become the expression of the future culture of your organization by championing the way you work with people. You become the expression of the future culture. I love that. Oh my gosh. And really, that's the perfect entryway to shape a company culture because, you know, a lot of people reach out to us and say, hey, you know, we love your work and what you're saying, but unfortunately, I'm not in a position of formal power. So I, there's nothing really that I can do, right? Nobody is. <laughs> turns yeah, out nobody is exactly, in the position of, is. you know, omniscience and omnipotence. So it so turns out nobody can do that. Exactly, exactly. And so... I think when you bring it down to the level of working relationships, suddenly you realize, of course, I can do so much actually to change things. And I like talking sometimes about, we say, BYB, bring your own booze. I like talking about um, this concept of BYC, bring your own culture, because I really nice. think that we are responsible for the culture in, I don't know what that diameter is or whatever, two meters from where we stand, whatever it is, but really, and we can carry it everywhere we go. Yeah, I love that. Let's go back to the three points. Do you have a third one for us? So being brave enough to make the invitation, asking people to do a little preparation around that. And then I think probably the third thing is to celebrate the exchange of information. You know, when I talk about coaching and in the coaching habit, and then I did a TEDx talk on how to tame your advice monster and your advice monster, you know, looms up and wants to fix it and solve it. And in the world of coaching and being more coach-like in organizations, we say the goal is just to stay curious a little bit longer and rush to action and advice giving a little bit more slowly. I think that probably applies here, which is you don't have to solve anything or fix anything or improve anything. You just being present to somebody being more 3D as a human in front of you and you're being more 3D yourself, which makes me want to add one more thing to this, which is there's an invitation to be vulnerable in this conversation. It's tempting to be cagey about that. You're like, I don't know how much I want to give away around any of this stuff because of politics and because of power and because of status. It's worth asking yourself how much risk are you willing to take? How vulnerable am I willing to be with this person in this conversation? And I would say that particularly if you're the more senior person, you have more status and balance, the extent to which you are vulnerable is the extent to which the other person will be vulnerable. You set the parameters around that. So I'm encouraging everybody to be the most vulnerable they can 
in a way that is appropriate. And that actually means that for some people, you're like, you know what, be safe around this. This might be a tricky conversation and it might be too soon to give up too much. But I think if you're a more senior person, it's like, you know, now's a chance for you to actually open up as much as you're, you're willing to, because that gives the other person permission to do the same. Yeah. I think especially if you are initiating this conversation as a senior person, even by how you position it, as you mentioned, if you say, hey, you know, I, ha I have never done this before, but it struck me as a good idea and I have no idea how it's going to go, but I'm really curious. I'd like to have this conversation. Even by saying that and positioning yourself as, a, as someone who's learning something is already a really great first step in, in this direction. Okay. Wonderful. So, I'm being mindful of time. I wish we had more time, but I know that we need to be wrapping up. Uh, we have this tradition of the rapid fire questions at the end. They're super quick. So I'm going to ask you five questions, rapid succession. And the goal is basically that you will answer all five in under two minutes. So at Culture Brains, the company that I run, we are on a mission to make work synonymous with fun, meaning and belonging. And I want to ask, what is your number one tip to bring more belonging to the workplace? Well, I think in the context of what we've been talking about, which is work gets done through human beings. So be human with other people. What is the sign or perhaps multiple signs that a company culture needs some work or perhaps even a major overhaul? I would say, you know, they, people separate culture and strategy all the time, but they're kind of the same. Strategy is what what's the the highest level of work we can do. Culture is who do we need to be to do that highest level of work? How well are you executing your strategy? And if you're not doing that great a job at it, um, and you're not keeping your best people doing their best work, working on the on the work that matters most, then your culture might not yet be aligned with your strategy in the way that you want. Do you admire any companies for their culture? And if yes, why? I don't know enough about most cultures and companies. Like you have to kind of, you, you can read about it and you're like, it's part myth, <laughs> part history, part, you know, architecture. So I admire the companies that I'm involved in. So Box of Crayons run by Shannon. They work very hard on their values and their culture and, and watching it change over the last four years since I've been CEO has been great. And then the company that I'm part of, MBS.Works, which is smaller, is a small team. But we work really hard on a way of working with each other, which is an expression of our culture. So I'm going to say the two companies that I know I admire the culture with. Hmm. I love that. And to wrap this all up, what is the question I haven't asked you in this interview today uh, yet, but I should have? That's a big question. And I love it. You know, I often finish a podcast with what needs to be said that hasn't yet been said. It is a similar invitation to to kind of go get a last squeeze of the lemon. You could have asked, what happens when you finished your Keystone conversation? What happens then? Are you done? What happens then? And the quick answer to that is, actually, you're not. A Keystone conversation is a wonderful start, but it's not a kind of one and done thing. It's not like you can kind of set it and then it's fixed and you just carry on after that. It sets you up for regular maintenance. And part of what will help your best possible relationships stay as a best possible expression of that relationship is regular maintenance. So adjustments, checking in, kind of continuing to talk about the health and the thrivingness of that working relationship. Well, that was wonderful. The final thing that I would like to ask you for is if our listeners want to learn more about you, about the book, about your work, what are the best online places for, for them to go to? Yeah, great. So we've already talked about if you want to uh, see a Keystone conversation and get downloads from the book at bestpossiblerelationship.com. You can obviously buy the books most places where you buy books. And if you want more about me and the work I do, mbs.works is the overall website with all the other books and the other courses and stuff that we have. And if you've already spent your, all your corporate budget, you can <laughs> with our guys, team and company. And you're like, you still have a bunch of money left over and you're like, we need it for coach skills training then boxofcrayons.com is that company. Fantastic. Thank you so much for this conversation today. Thank you. That was lovely. I'm Aga Bayer, the creator and host of the Culture Lab podcast. And this is the Culture Lab team. Anis El Nabarawi, 
Production Manager. Sound Producer, Heather McPherson, Twisted Spur Media. Thank you for joining Michael and me for this episode of the Culture Lab podcast. If you found this conversation interesting or inspiring or valuable, and chances are that you did since you're still listening here, you'll also enjoy the previous conversation that I had with Michael, where we talk about cultivating a coaching culture. You'll find a link in the show notes. If you haven't already done so, please go ahead and follow the Culture Lab podcast in your favorite listening app. And please do me a favor. It's going to be a few seconds favor. And, you know, maybe share it on social or by text or by email, even just with one person. Just copy the link from the app that you're using and tell your friends who want to find new, better ways of cultivating a great company culture about the Culture Lab. Tell them to listen and then perhaps chat about what you've both discovered. Because when shows like this one become conversations and conversations become action, that's how we transform the workplace together. And if you want to dive even deeper into the topic and find like-minded peers who are in charge of culture work in their organizations, you might consider joining Culture Brain. It's our one-of-a-kind culture accelerator program and a global community of peers that is truly shaping the future of work. You can learn more at tinyurl.com forward slash culture brains, and you'll find the link in the show notes. Thanks again for tuning in. If you want to get free resources on cultivating a remarkable, powerful, and authentic company culture, especially in a business that scales, type this into your browser. agabayer.com forward slash resources. If you haven't subscribed to the Culture Lab yet, please do it now. That's the best way you can support our work. And finally, we would be ever so grateful if you could rate and review our podcast on the platform that you listen to. Thank you. And you are amazing for listening to this point. Not many people do.